I just I tells us that we're dealing with essentially a worst case scenario. I'm afraid. Sorry, I have a little bit of tells us that we're dealing with essentially trouble here getting scenario. started. I'm I apologize for this. I think it's gonna get there. We're dealing with essentially a worst case scenario. I was hearing an echo there for a minute. I wasn't sure where it was coming from. I thought I had all my ducks in a row and I didn't have my water here. And then Northern Wisconsin. Since when are you from Northwest Wisconsin? I did not know that. Seriously, you didn't hear the echo? I heard an echo. That was so bizarre. Can somebody check and see if YouTube is live? I think I'm live I on YouTube, but good for kids. We're so busy. Live. I had to close that window. I thought it was echoing. No more in society. We want everybody to feel good. That's not that's not the way life is. Uh, there was no sound this in the beginning. This episode is sponsored by Moink. That's moo plus oink. <laughs> My point is that if if we were able to, just like we're trying to kind of get everybody to take the vaccine, if we had put that into getting everybody to take ivermectin and fluvoxamine for for a month, if we, and, and if we could accomplish that, then COVID would be wiped out. We could do it, and actually any municipality that could regulate its borders could clear the disease if it could accomplish that right. goal, I, I right. believe. <laughs> But you can tell if someone's lying, you know, you can sort of feel it in people. And then I have lied, I'm sure I'll lie again. I don't want to lie, you know, I don't think I'm a liar. I try not to be a liar, I don't want to be a liar. I think it's like really important not to be a liar. Thank you. Shaking up the water, getting it cold. <clears throat> Back from the gym. <clears throat> my uh 12 year old son has shot more than uh 14 000 shots in the last two months which is pretty incredible um it, it's pretty incredible rumble good excellent thank you pamela all right i'm really excited that this is working okay <clears throat> well he just started this year so he's not anywhere near a mini jordan yet but he is enjoying himself a lot and it's uh, a lot of father and son's time that wasn't happening before. So basketball has been a very, very good idea for this family. Um, very good idea. Oh, should I pause and tell you right now? Should I just pause and tell you right now that I had a two and a half, almost three hour conversation with Ed today? That's the reason why I didn't make the one o'clock deadline before basketball. It was one of the most amazing conversations I've ever had. I'm going to headline the Red Pill Expo. I'm going to headline it. I'm getting a whole hour. We're going to we're going to do a it's I'm almost I'm so freaking out. I can't tell you. Don't tell anyone, though. That's just for us. That's just secret. Um, but yeah, he's going to promote it on the website as soon as I get him a headshot and as soon as I get him a, a thingamabobber. Um, so it's it's really, really good. Um, really, really good. Yeah, it is so freaking awesome. Um, it is so freaking awesome. And that's because people have been sharing this work and people have been pushing it around and somebody pushed the right stream in front of, of Ed and the next thing you know, uh, that guy tried four days in a row to call me. Um, he had some kind of problem with his landline and uh, so I couldn't always get through to that. And then I wasn't at his desk, but he was at his desk. Uh, the Red Pill Expo, I think, is in... Um, is in Rapid City, South Dakota, which is an incredible metropolis of culture and um, and distraction, of course, right? That's the reason why they have it there. So there's no distraction to stay focused on the biology, not take the bait on TV or social media, love our neighbors. I believe it's in Rapid City. Um, I don't know that for sure because I didn't find the website yet. Um, but yes, it's coming and uh, it's gonna be very exciting because I have actually been asked to, to do it. So it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, I don't, 
I don't even really know what to say other than we should be very excited and I'm going to work very hard to make sure I don't make a fool of any of us um, and, uh, and represent uh, the sacred biology as well as possible. Um, restore some reverence up in the house, if you will. So it's going to be really great. I'm really excited. It was really nice to talk to him. He's 92 years old. Do you know 92 years old? Oh my gosh, we talked about so much stuff. It was like one of those conversations where I started to think about, okay, now maybe I'm exposing myself to too much uh, radiation on my head here. Uh, so 92, who's 92? Um, Ed Griffin is 92. Um, if you can hear me over the music, Ed Griffin is 92. Part of what I would, I, I, a new honorary member at least of the, uh, of the, uh, yeah, of the, in, the independent Bright Web, and uh, he's an, asked me to participate in a event that he's organizing. I assume I can tell you guys, um, and in, in, a, in a week or so, it'll probably be up on the website. As far as I know, um, let's just let's just with an I N, um, but let's just keep our Griffin is F F I N. Let's just keep it under our hats for now. Let's not start posting it all over social media yet. When it when it's when we have a website and and whatever, yeah, he is the OG indeed. He's the OG in terms of you know figuring it out. The guy who was trying to get us to drop our hands a long time ago to stop stop hiding. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting where we're gonna go here. We'll see. We'll see. But um, I'm gonna do it. And we'll see what happens. So I'm, I'm excited. It'll be the first time I've done anything like that. Um, so uh, I hope it's a good crowd, of, uh, a group of people. I'm sure it is, given who Ed Griffin is and what he's done for us as a, as a country to try and bring bring awareness to how our, our financial system is run, how our money system is run in such a way that the people who have... Uh, control of the bus are actually able to do a, quite a lot more than to decide just where we're going um if you can write numbers into books and create money and other people can't that's a pretty spectacular um that's a pretty pretty spectacular uh power and indeed that's how the united states and many other western countries are essentially controlled is that that through fractional reserve banking anyway that's not the specialty of this place this is a place to get some biology in your head or or get some clarity about biology in your head. Today, I'm really hoping um, we can enjoy ourselves a little bit, relax a little bit. Um, I had to pull something off of the, the curated list of curious videos. Um, I hope you don't mind a study hall like this. Um, I'm doing a lot of those lately because I don't want to roll out any new slides until um, it's, it's worth you downloading them. Um, and so... Uh, we're working on a slide deck for Prion mini course and we're working on a slide deck for a couple other mini courses and that's how I've started to think about it in my head as a mini course because it, it feels more doable if I can do something over the course of a week with a couple of breaks in between then I think a mini course might be three days or four days where we really try to journal club our way out of some holes um, so that's the kind of um, plan I've got besides um, just trying to be online every day so this is you know a, a little oomph in that direction as well um, not trying to use an excuse that I couldn't do it this afternoon to make it so that I couldn't do it tonight um, there's some nice food upstairs that may or may not come down on a plate and I may or may not turn off the microphone occasionally to have a couple mouthfuls um, I am a little hungry but I'm not gonna eat on camera I promise I won't share any food noises with you um, we are still facing this conscious and intelligent manipulation of organized habits. Um, we repeat this over and over again, more for the people who might be stumbling on us for the first time. Uh, let me see if I can get this on here. And so uh, I repeat it a lot, but I'll get this uh, music out of the way here. Um, I repeat it a lot, but reality, you know, is that that it's worth repeating that that this has been a long-standing problem. It's one we haven't been aware of. I wasn't aware of. I was aware of it in a compartmentalized way. You know, of course, they lie about celebrities. Of course, they can put bad stories in the news if they want to and ruin somebody's reputation. But it never dawned on me that it'd be basically 
the entire accepted history of the United States might more or less be manipulated to a lesser or greater extent at all times. It had never dawned on me that the history uh, and and content of certain biological fields could be manipulated in a very similar way. And in fact, I think that's that's the reality where we live, much like Alan Dulles is purported to have said that when the American public everything the American public believes is false, then we will have finally succeeded or something like this. This is how they, they, they have been governing us for quite some time. And they tell us truths that are not dangerous to their rule and not dangerous to the presuppositions of the system that, that perpetuate their rule. And if we look back to a cartoon in the Chicago Tribune from 1934, um, you will see a lot of interesting things um, young pinkies from Columbia, and, oh, sorry, young pinkies and Columbia and Harvard, um, drunk on power, riding in some kind of thing here. I mean, Tugwell ahead, I guess that probably has something to do with somebody who's driving the cart, depleting the resources of the soundest government in the world by shoveling money out. And this is Wallace, I don't know who, and Ike's shoveling money out into the street there's stalin in the background going how red the sunrise is getting and then here on this painting it says uh, the plan of action for the u.s is spend 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 under the guise of recovery bust the government blame the capitalists for the failure junk the constitution and declare a dictatorship 1934 guess there were conspiracy theorists back then too so the principle of informed consent is one way that you can kind of try to find if there's a light on anywhere inside of someone's head. If we start talking about injections in general, um, for example, the guy at the, the gym the other day when I told you that I was helping him carry this ladder and he said that he had just gotten a shingles shot in his arm and that's why he couldn't carry the ladder as easily. I could have said, for example, well, what kind of informed consent do you get with something like that? Do they just tell you you need a shingle shot or do they give you a brochure? What's that all about? But I didn't have it. And and this is a great example of how we all need to more actively have a set of responses ready when we encounter things situations like this me the guy that that's wants to stream every night about this stuff dropped the ball when i was at the gym the other day carrying that ladder with that guy would have been a perfect time to bring up the principle of informed consent in the context of that single shot and just kind of ask him like i'm just wondering on behalf of maybe my dad or something you can bullshit him if you want to i'm not wondering for my dad he can take a single shot i guess if he wants to he thinks i'm a know-it-all so the the point would be though that with with this guy at the gym i could have said hey with regard to you know how did that come about did they tell you that did you ask for it you know what's the deal and maybe he would tell me maybe he wouldn't but my guess is i've known him long enough i've been i've been you know shooting the shit with him for a while now i i think that that's not too probing of a question because i'm not asking him what he believes i just asked him you know informed consent and if you say it in that way um it I think sets a very high bar of ob objectivity, you know, just hey, by the way, you know, I'm wondering. And and that could go any number of places, right? That could go to the informed consent that was was provided or not provided in that person's mind with regard to the COVID vaccine. It could go to informed consent with regard to he doesn't even know what it is anymore. Um, it, there's a lot of ways that that could have opened doors that I blew it. So informed consent, I say, a lot, for a lot of different reasons. It's because of the concept, it's important to understand that concept. It's important for us to teach our children that concept in lots of different contexts as both responsibility and as a kind of barrier or, or boundary that shouldn't be crossed. And um, I really think that, that also in terms of communicating with other people, it's a really great way to kind of ping uh, the depth of their understanding. And you can say it in a way that that kind of doesn't necessarily belie the side of the equation on which you reside at this time. Um, anyway, that's why I keep one of the reasons why I say this almost every night. Um, and of course, our hypothesis remains the same. Our hypothesis is that somewhere here in 2020, they created a few mass casualty events and they misconstrued that as the 
the evidence of the beginning of a preeminent, you know, worst case scenario where up to a billion people could die. And that level of potential for a global disaster, a global emergency pre-required them to declare the emergency that would allow them to say, hey, it's spreading. Look at New York City. So we've got to start testing. Then they flubbed the test and made it, you know, seem like, oh my gosh, it's just ineptitude and rushing and and you know the clashing between Trump and 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 uh, NHS and it, all this nonsense that in reality was one big theater to make sure that the worst case scenario narrative of a gain of function virus having released from a lab would be something that would permeate and argue and and bubble in the background enough so that both sides of a limited spectrum of debate would eventually come to the conclusion that although the PCR tests weren't perfect, although they overcycled them, although there were there were people that weren't killed directly of COVID, but just with COVID, there definitely is a COVID, there definitely is a SARS-2 that wasn't there before 2020, and it started spreading in 2020 or late 2019. And the acceptance of that basic premise allows them to see the narrative that includes a mythology that's never before been supported in in biology with real observations. We've never tracked an RNA molecule from a from a puddle in a market to uh, all corners of the globe before to different species before and tested zoo animals expecting them to be positive. And yet here we're supposed to believe that all of these observations are of equal clarity and of equal fidelity, and it's just ridiculous. There's no question in my mind that this is a combination of bad diagnostics and also a really hot background of RNA and DNA from a wide variety of sources that can't really be adequately quantified. And so if you pretend that a PCR test is specific for something when there are no symptoms present, you're just misleading entire, basically entire fields. And, and it's unfortunate because what I'm trying to argue, ladies and gentlemen, is that there are academic biologists out there in every major city in the United States who should really know this. They should really know that the way we use PCR in the context of a sample from a patient with a single pair of primers with no positive or negative controls, no replication and triplicate, no sequencing of the amplicon that we amplified, there would this would pass no muster in any academic setting. And yet to decide the fate of people's lives and to decide whether or not they go on crazy protocol AB4 or whether they get treated like they any other patient would have been treated with these symptoms is dependent on that very diagnostic being obviously applied in a way that will not give them the specificity that they would want if it was a medical setting. We're not talking about academic fraud, about some, some uh, obscure G protein coupled receptor subunit that, that you're sequencing or that you're saying is present in a brain region and therefore partially responsible for whatever a little circuitry where you're interested in and getting a fake paper for it. We're talking about diagnosing the presence of a pathogen and potentially implying the infectiousness of someone or their, their potential for harming others, as we say on television. And so the use of PCR in such a, a negligent way and the way that there's nobody at any university that seems to want to just speak up and say, look, it's not about cycle count. It's about these all these other things that we know at the academic bench are required in order to establish that a PCR amplicon result means what you say it means. Every one of them that has published a PCR result knows the, the kinds of controls that are done at minimum. And yet in none of these situations, in none of these diagnostics, are any of these controls present. And it is not dissimilar to what they did with AIDS. Although with AIDS, a lot of times the test was an antibody. The presence of 
an antibody that was indicated right by by a test that they would make not through sequencing not through spec high high specificity this is this is like pull down kind of things you know uh, false positives are are obviously possible and so we're we're in the same place now where they have used testing and diagnostics and a probably a few mass casualty events created in order to make sure a few viral videos in order to make sure that people really thought that worst case scenario was possible and yes i do believe that they could have used an infectious clone in order to achieve this and it would have been very effective and the people that would have used the patient samples that had the infectious clone in them would never have known wow this this virus grows well this sure is cytopathic in all these places it's not what happened when they isolated the virus in Wuhan, or at least the paper that says they isolated a virus in Wuhan, it was like two wells out of 96 plate, uh, well plate that actually showed the cytopathic or whatever they call them effects where they said there was a virus and then they sequenced those two holes. And what they say they amplified was the, the, the whole genome of a coronavirus that they then published, I don't know when, but then they deleted a database and everybody found out that they deleted a database. And so obviously the Chinese must have done it or something. And this was all a big show to make sure that you would be more concerned about where the virus came from than what they were going to give you to cure it. They, the, it was a foregone conclusion that there was going to be a vaccine in that meeting with Donald Trump. But it was going to take a while, but there was definitely going to be a vaccine. And in the meantime, there was this bridge, as Mark pointed out, that would get us there that were these therapeutics and these monoclonal antibodies and all this other stuff. I think they wanted another year or so of, of things. And it might have even been warp speed that, that sort of threw everything off. That, that could have been the unplanned part of the plan. And they barely were able to stretch it to where they got control of the White House again before that stuff already started. I, I don't know. It's a very curious uh, set of observations that can be made if one keeps your eyes open now. And it's, it's really important that we do so as we move forward. Because there is a still united agreement that there was a mystery virus that can account for many or all of the excess deaths over the last three years. And this idea that there's a mystery virus that it can account for these deaths, this is an idea that is shared by all of these people, by the Dark Horse podcast, by, by Paul Offit and Twiv. Um, everybody believes this. And so essentially we've made no progress. As I pointed out last night, these people even had Denny Rancor fly across the world to Romania, make him feel like, he was being heard, put him on stage like they may be doing to me in, in, in South Dakota. Put me on stage, make me feel like I'm heard. Maybe they'll even say, hey, Jay says there's no pandemic. But they might, I don't know, say something else. I don't know what's going to go on, but I know what they did to Denny Rancor. They called him over there. They flew him over there. They all made friends with him. They all came back and pretended to promote him, but actually they didn't promote him and his story at all. They promoted themselves, and they said, wow, we were right. Look, Denny Rancor calculates 17 million people were hurt from the shot. What they don't say is that Denny Rancor also says there's no evidence of the spreading pathogen. It looks like people were killed by protocols. They could say that. They, they, they met him in person in Romania. They listened to his talk in Romania. They said they were really impressed by his talk. But they must have all been simultaneously like texting each other about how good his talk was when he said that there was no evidence of spreading pathogen, and that's why they missed it. I guess that's what happened. I can't otherwise, I can't explain why they wouldn't have said that in at least Robert Malone's substack about meeting, no, or Jessica Rose's substack about having breakfast with, no, and, 
and and uh brett weinstein has covered it a couple times on his on his live podcast and nope didn't say it at all didn't even come close to saying it never have these people come close to saying that there was really no evidence of spread of a particularly novel and dangerous pathogen never have they pointed out that that Fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and the confusion that started at the beginning of the pandemic might have already hurt people. They have never, ever acknowledged what we are talking about for the last month or so, which is overuse of pulse oximeters and supplementary oxygen could have easily damaged a lot of people. Could have been a very easy way to get people on ventilators. It could have actually been the reason why they sent people home when they were kind of sick, but not really sick. Don't come back until your pulse ox is such and such. Because then when you come back, we can give you supplementary oxygen, and then we know where that's going to take us. We may have been wrong about why they were sending people home. Some people said that they were sending people home to save the hospital from being overloaded. Some people said that that was missing the possibility of treating people early. And so they were trying to make things worse. It could have also been so that people come into the hospital, the first they can do is start them with supplementary oxygen. And then all of the symptoms that happen as a result of the supplementary oxygen will necessarily be attributed to COVID because that's the whole reason they're in there in the first place. And oxygen doesn't hurt people. This is a big deal. It's a big deal that all the doctors that, that listen to this stream haven't said anything yet. And all the doctors that we've sent emails to haven't said anything yet. They could all add it to the list of reasons why we should be pissed. And they're not adding it. No one has added this to their list yet. And it's actually gigantic. Because it's a very easy way to explain why anyone would get to the stage where they were ventilated. Anyone would get to the stage why they got worse when they went to the hospital. But they weren't ventilated if they were given supplementary oxygen even at a normal level never mind at a level like mark has described with something like 10 or 20 or 30 liters a minute do not resuscitate orders in new york city are probably how they created much of this mess because that's also how they got a lot of people to die of heart attacks and call it covid because they still got to bill those deaths COVID deaths are COVID deaths, even if they died in someone's house and you just brought them to the morgue. Ventilators were probably misused, but the question really is, how did they get people on the ventilators? I think they got them on the ventilators by hurting them with supplementary oxygen. I think this is a really great observation by Jessica and Mark and others. And I think it's striking how few people will just say, oh yeah, that's terrible. Thomas Binder said it immediately in my interview with him. The lack of antibiotic use, is it really noticed? I mean, the only antibiotic that was promoted by, by the uh, American uh, or America's frontline doctors was zithromycin, azithromax, and azithromycin, and that's a product by Pfizer. So they didn't say antibiotics. They, they stated a very specific product, plus hydroxychloroquine is a, they, you know, they had to say zinc all the time, but that's really probably the most important thing. And if you look at one of the last videos of Zev Zelenko, you will find him in his car saying that it's like a national security secret that any uh, zinc ionophore and, and zinc, is supplementary zinc, is a, is a solution to all RNA viruses. And so when they said hydroxychloroquine and zinc, and then they said uh, Zithromax, and she yelled it into the mic, Dr. Emanuel. It's a very, it's a, not a random choice. We have been played, ladies and gentlemen, by lots of people, unfortunately. The poor use of steroids is underspoken about, and that's also a very easy way to bring people out of the spiral of a, of a cytokine storm. I told people on the stream that I might eat something just in case. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
remdesivir and midazolam might be one of those things where you, if you just focus on those things, it's not that dangerous. Then those are narratives they can talk their way out of. Not everybody died of remdesivir, so it'll be a way that even doctors can talk their way out of it in their own minds. And so those aren't nearly as dangerous as the overuse of pulse oximeters and oxygen to people who were given it. And if they think back and realize that everybody was given it, oh, we gave lots of people high flow nasal oxygen with even with a mask over their face or something like that. If they are not aware of the acute toxic effects of such a treatment, when it's not, especially when it's not necessary, they may have treated those those acute symptoms that resulted from that as part of the progression of COVID, just because they were panicked, just because they weren't thinking. They were exhausted, I don't know, because they watched TV skillfully. Because they read the newspaper, that's one of the things that Mark did in his last show. He showed all kinds of newspaper articles that were all talking about pulse oximeters and pulse ox for some reason as a primary indicator of disease progression. Why were all these newspaper articles written for shit's sake? Why did that suddenly become the primary indicator in all these newspapers? Was how is that possible? Have we always used pulse ox to indicate people's progression in pneumonia before? And if so, why didn't we understand it in that way? Why Did we give people oxygen, supplementary oxygen, the moment they went to below 95? Like it said in one of the articles that Mark showed, that below 95 pulse ox is like some kind of danger? And still the only person that's talking about opioid deaths really is Mark. I mean, I mention it. It's on my slide all the time. But, you know, besides me and Mark, who's mentioning it? Who understands that the all-cause mortality just had to increase? The excess deaths just had to increase. And then they had to be spectacularly committed to the lie that the only new death on the blocks, uh, uh, new deaths on the block are, are the deaths caused by the novel virus. The graph that we saw in Vincent Rancid Yellow's lecture yesterday where the, the dotted line of projected uh, uh, life expectancy was going to go down in 2020, that could have easily been from the opioid epidemic. It's as if Vincent Rancid Yellow is completely unaware. Rack and Yellow is completely unaware that in the last four years, more than 500,000 people have died of opioid deaths. It's just conveniently, I didn't realize that. Sorry, wow. I, I thought all those people died of COVID too because there aren't even that, you know, that's the problem. These numbers are just magical numbers that are based on what you call excess deaths. If you don't call 500,000 people dying of opioids excess deaths, if they're just normal, then the number of excess deaths in that year will be very different than if you call all those people excess deaths every year. Is there an acceptable number of people that die of opioid deaths, overdose? Is there an acceptable number of people under 40 to die of that? Just kind of tough shit. Some people think so. I don't, but some people think so. Some people think that it is kind of tough shit. They should know better or had better parents or something like that. It's not the way that works, especially when it's part of an elaborate plan to control, demolish America and do it in the guise of a pandemic and its response so that we beg for it. Death certificate fraud, financial incentives. I mean, come on. They were, what is it, $32,000 a body? PCR fraud, lateral flow test fraud, sequencing fraud, it's all the same thing. We don't talk about the, you know, the Medicare costs that were saved. We don't talk about strict liability, Seventh Amendment violation. We don't talk about the epidemiological evidence of spread. So the, I think the, bio, the, the biology is the way out. And, and the other flip side is to understand the kinds of mythologies that they've been talking about behind the scenes for a really long time. And what I want you to do today... to do today 
is listen to this man by the name of Ray Kurzweil and listen to him talk about the singularity and other things. Um, he claims to have been the guy who he claims to be, his claim to fame is that he's been working on artificial intelligence longer than anyone else alive. Um, and he'll explain that. Um, and he believes at some point very soon that the singularity between uh, biology and machine is going to occur and that this is going to have, you know, a generational spanning consequences for all of us. Um, and so there's a lot of really crazy things that come out in this conversation. But I want to be sure that we are watching this movie with the same mindset. And the way that we should be watching this mindset in my uh, movie, in, excuse me, in my humble opinion, is that we should be watching it with the mindset that this is the kind of of uh, let's say for example that a bunch of rich people were going to get together in the wine cellar of some rich person's house and they were going to you know have a candlelight dinner in this nice basement of a restaurant that somebody owns off of Sardinia and it's uh you know a restaurant from the 1600s built in the, some old chapel and they're you know all these old friends are there and they're all billionaires and they're all hanging out and they're talking about how they're going to do this um, and then they have a couple smart people in the room, not just rich people, but also a couple smart people in the room that like to tell the big stories. And they're kind of like, um, uh, uh, what's that physicist's name? Uh, Tyson? Is that his name? Uh, anyway, they're kind of like him, you know, but, but they're for the rich people. And I really think Ray Kurzweil is one of these guys who has been telling these stories to the richest of rich for a very long time. And that's why he behaves in the way that he does in the video. He's extremely confident of his correctness, his rightness, how smart he is. Um, it's almost laughable that he uh, takes the time to talk to the people in the room and to let this guy interview him. And in a lot of ways, actually, you might be annoyed by the interviewer or, or hear his skepticism. I'm going to leave it at 1.5 speed um, because otherwise it'll take me way too long to get through it. Um, and in that 1.5 speed, you might not be able to hear exactly how much skepticism the interviewer has, but actually the interviewer has a very healthy skepticism and I actually appreciate it. Um, but Ray Kurzweiler is absolutely unfazed. Um, and at some point in the video, he says that if people at least, um, uh, if people live five more years, they will live long enough to live 500 years if they are diligent. I shit you not. And this is a, uh, I believe it's a talk from no less than, it, it could be uh, less than three weeks ago. Um, I guess I could go like this and, and see. And then I'll just go back up again. It's... Uh, Four weeks ago, so one month ago in Portugal. Yes? Enjoy. Here we go. All right. I'm so excited to be here with you, Ray. Great to be here. Great to see everybody together. I don't know why it's so <laughs> dim. Hold on a second. <laughs> so my favorite thing in that gonna, introduction of you was that you... I'm going to figure that out. Let me get my head out of the way, make sure this volume's all the way up. It is. So that means I guess i got to turn this volume up. I didn't think it was so low before. Hmm... I wonder if I'm doing anything wrong here. It looks okay. I'm just going to jerk it, make it. You've been working in AI longer than any other human alive, which means if you live forever, and we'll get to that, you will always have that distinction. <laughs> I, think, I think that's right. Uh, Marvin Minsky was actually my mentor. Uh, if he were alive today, he would actually be more than 61 years. But I'm going to bring him back also. So <laughs> I'm not sure how we'll count the distinction then. All right, so we're going to fix the audio. But this is what we're going to do with this conversation. I'm going to start out asking Ray some questions about where we are today. We'll do that for a few minutes. Then we'll get into what has to happen to reach the singularity, so the next 20 years. Then we'll get into a discussion about what the singularity is, what it means, how it would change our lives. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how, if we believe this vision of the future, what it means for us today. Ask your questions. They'll come in. I'll ask them as they go into different sections of the conversation. But let's get cracking. Can you hear me? You can't hear Ray. Well, this will be recorded. You guys are going to all live forever. There'll be plenty of time. It will be fine. Oh, shoot. Oh, you know what's gonna, this is gonna be? I'm gonna stop the YouTube stream. I don't know, it's, YouTube's not gonna like me 